you like haunts? Yes. Do you like immersive theater? Yes. Do you like escape rooms? Yes. What's the safe word? My haunt life. Hello and welcome to the My Haunt Life podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. And Russell, we are now in our into our second podcast for 2018. This is true. Um, one thing we didn't get to on the last podcast, because we started talking about all the things that we had done and we caught up on, um, was what our top three or four or five shows were of 2017. So I think we should get that out of the way right now. Okay, sure. I, like, Yeah, because 2017 had lots of stuff in it. Good and bad, to be totally honest. Um, I, you go first, man. No, I brought it up. You. No, what? I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So as far as just general overall shows go, um, I, I think my favorite show of the year was from Speakeasy Society, and it was the third part of their trilogy based on Johnny Got His Gun called uh, The Johnny Cycle, The Living, was their final entry into that. And... Uh, you know, I don't. I don't need to rehash the whole show, but you know, this was sort of a, the end of a three-year journey with this theater company. Uh, this trilogy took place over a few years. Uh, it was, you know, a two-hour epic show, and and the reason I would have to put that on top is is it was to me it was just such an epic, emotionally devastating, and yet at the same time, part of it was awkward and part of it was humorous and part of it was sexy. And then it was complete emotional devastation across the board. Uh, and few shows engaged me the way that that one did. Mm -hmm. I'm right there with you. Yeah. I just, um, I know both of us had different experiences at different times. I think each of us at one point, you know, when we talked about it, I, you know, I, I hate to, oh, this is going to sound so fluffy and flowery. Oh, no. <laughs> um, there were moments in that show that were revelatory for me that were just, you know, where you have to rethink certain aspects of your life. And I, I think when you're lucky enough to experience something like that in a show, it's a thrill. It's a blessing. It's fun in some weird, thrilling way, even if you're crying and emotionally devastated at that point that it's happening. But for me, I think that is the show that hit more emotional levels, uh, was so interesting, so phenomenally staged and directed. The performances were amazing. Um, that, that, to me, was the top show of the year for me personally. That's awesome. What else you got? No, wait, you, you... What? <laughs> what? I have my top five, but I have them in alphabetical order, so I was just going to go through them. Uh, <laughs> so finish off your top whatever number you have. Uh, um, uh, okay. Um, another show which was very unique and I think took both of us by surprise was Scott Expedition Company's The Nest. Mm -hmm. uh, I The reason that was one of the top shows of the year is it was a completely new thing uh we didn't know what to expect going into it right and it delivered on creating a unique world it was something that we could explore and could have fun with and it had things to figure out and think and literally explore and i mean like crawling around on our hands and knees and you know going through tunnels and and you know finding things and eventually it became a story and you, you, you were told the story by what you found and audio tapes that you found and played during the course of the evening. Um, it, it was kind of magical to me, actually. Mm -hmm. Even going with me? So Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it, it, because it, it's funny because you didn't have a chance to go through, through it a second time. I did. And it was very different going with a different person. So uh, you and I went faster because we kind of went into escape room mode. Right. And then the other person and I went into more exploratory mode. Cool. So, yeah, but it was just, it was such a unique twist on anything that we had seen before. And that was the exciting part for me. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to see what they come up with next. Absolutely. You're still not jumping in. No, I'll just do, we should just do them all in a row. <laughs> okay. Stop uh, stalling. 
as far as shows go, um, uh, the artist David Cho put on something called The Cho Show, which you sort of had to be interviewed. You sent in an application, and then people either got one or two phone calls, multiple phone, phone calls, and you were sort of chosen to go through this show. And for me, the the reason that this stands so high and above so many other things I saw this year is again, this was the creation of a completely unique world. Mm -hmm. You entered a building in Los Angeles and it had been transformed into this sort of mystical land where there were everything from... I'm just um, pointing out that you did sign a waiver that said you would never, ever talk about this. Oh, how much detail can I go into? <laughs> None. You might have said too much already. <laughs> um... Oh, that's right. I did, didn't I? Yep. But, I, uh, I did too. We all did. So I, I will say this. Many different characters and creatures and things that you met along the way. And what is <laughs> what would not be breaking an NDA is to say that the overall effect of it for me, Mike, this was a completely supportive space. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah, we and I, you, you, pardon me, we and, we I, and I, we and I, you and I had different paths during the show. I did not, most of what you saw, I did not see. Most of what I saw, you did not see. Mm -hmm. And for me, the path that I was on was all about encouragement, support, love, building my confidence in myself, pushing us in a way that encouraged us to explore ourselves and to believe in ourselves and our value as human beings and to see the potential that I might have for the rest of my life, what to do, who to become from here. And that was an amazing gift. And I will say this, Mike, um, you know that I've had some trials and tribulations during the second half of the year. Mm -hmm. I have gone back several times and reflected on the Cho show as I've been dealing with some of the, stuff that I've had to deal with over the course of the last year. Yeah. So it did have an effect on me very positively. So that's three. That, that's... How many more you got? <laughs> well, uh, one thing I, I, you know, other things that I would like to just throw out there is, you know, I'm talking shows. We also did, you know, escape rooms and we did other things during the year. I just want to throw out that for me, my favorite escape room of the year was down in Fullerton, Zoe. Escapade is the name of the company that, that puts on the Zoe escape room. I found that to be sort of a thrill ride, man. Uh, and it, it, to this day, is going to, I, it is and I think will always be one of my favorite escape room moments. There was a certain moment in the middle of that escape room where you turned to me and you, I don't want to say exactly what you said. If, if it's the moment I'm thinking of, I didn't turn. I was grabbing at you and screaming something yes yeah <laughs> that moment <laughs> yeah was awesome <laughs> uh yeah and and i that that is my favorite escape room of the year um hands down i also thoroughly enjoyed uh something i talked to you about brooklyn the come not a quest escape room because that was again completely unique in the fact that it was such a small space that you had to deal with and i thought that was a really unique very claustrophobic escape room which i thought was really fun and a very clever way of having to work with a partner to get out of the room mm -hmm. so um i i i think that covers the most of the the top stuff of the year for me how about you okay. so when russell asks you for your top three in russell numbers that's five well i gave three shows and, and then, then it's and two, escape es room. two escape, two escape rooms. rooms yeah yeah that's five so that's not top three of the year All right. oh and locally we should mention There's another thing six <laughs> um another thing that i thought was really cool that both of us did at different times was the evil genius escape rooms mm -hmm. the fact that you they offer this ability to do two different escape rooms as one continuous storyline and they're very different in tone and mood. And I thought that was, again, I'm going back to the things that like, wow, this is new. This is exciting. Right. So that's another one. So, cool. so what are your top six, Mike? No, uh, top five, since <laughs> you asked what the top were for the year. Okay. Not what are your top shows? What are your top escape rooms? So go I jumbled them all together since you're not clear. Okay, go for it. Thanks a lot. So my top five of 2017, and this includes everything, and I'm doing this in alphabetical order um, because I'm 
PC or something. Okay. Um, cause I don't want to offend anyone. Um, but number one was comic con, the musical, uh, this took place at, at fringe fest. And if you are into comics and all the stuff that they call like that, people call us nerds for liking back in the day, like, you know, comic books and superheroes and toys and pop culture and stuff like that. This show was for you. Um, it was written, directed, I believe by Nicholas Brandt and who also is a comic book artist and writer. Uh, so going to comic con many, many times for many, many years, I've seen all of these people and I think that's why it it had a soft spot in my heart for it because it's like, Oh, I I know that person. Like I know that person. I know the struggle that they're going through right now, you know, like that kind of stuff. So it was just such a fun and happy show for me. Like I was just happy to be there and happy to watch it. Yeah. I completely agree with you. That was definitely one of the highlights of the fringe show. Yeah. And you saw that because I made you right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I wasn't sure if I would relate to it. When you spoke so highly of it, I made an effort to go see it, and I'm so glad that I did, because you're right. It, you recognize yourself, you recognize your friends. You it, like it is a universal thing. It connects with everyone, I think, on some level. And I the, hope that comes back somehow, and or, or grows to be something bigger and and in another venue somehow. Yeah, uh, yeah, it would be nice to see that again. I do too. And the thing is, there was like a hidden message in it of being a better you. You know, true. Finding your own superpower and stuff, and accepting others for who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my second show is a show that you had mentioned. It was the Cho Show. Um, same thing. Um, I was also going through a weird time of my life when that show happened. And the fact that uh, going back to what you said about how it was about support, it was about, you know, being a safe space. It was about all those things. It definitely helped me in my personal life. Like this wasn't a show like this was therapy, you know, and it's like it's weird when you say that out loud because, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to, to see this show and blah, blah, blah. But it's it was so much more than that to me. Um, you, you said a bunch already. Um, so you're the one that's going to get sued. Um, I'm not going to say any (laughs) more, um, except it was definitely one of the top things. I hope this somehow comes back some iteration, because if you missed it, even if you have the best life in the world and you're happy and have no issues or problems or anything, you will still get something out of that show. Uh, And then number three, uh, another show that you mentioned, um, Johnny the Living. I mean, Mm. I mean, you just like Chojo, you said everything, except you won't get sued for talking about Johnny. Um, (laughs) But everything about that. And, you know, I definitely had uh, like a, a couple like just kind of incredible reactions and, you know, life, you know, life altering moments in that show just based on becoming so invested in that in one character and getting at like one that one question just always sticks in my mind and everything that happened after that you know it's like do you do like does your life matter and i think about that every day and it's just it's still mind-blowing to me that i'm still thinking about it because like i was always that person that's like i'm I'm so tiff i have a wall up i don't have feelings but you know like when when he asked me that, like it wrecked me and it still wrecks me to this day. And the fact that it's still doing that to me just shows you how powerful this piece was. Yeah, I agree. And I, I did my first time through, I did not experience the scene you're referring to. Uh, my second time through, that was the finale for me. And I went through that scene with two people that I know. So we knew a little bit of each other's history. Mm -hmm. So when I was standing in that room with people who knew me and who I knew to have those questions come up the way they do by the end of that scene, you know, I will say I wasn't the first to cry that night. I don't think, (laughs) (laughs) but by the end of it, all three of us were just weeping. And then the actor wept with us. It was such a beautiful, as you said, uh, it, it just it was a moment that resonates and will resonate for probably years to come for me that's how hard that show hit me mhm uh and then next on my list is london calling uh and this was another fringe fest show and it was 
a musical um and it had all music from the clash that like the actors sang and each song made sense to the specific scene it was in or following or precursing it's pre is precursing the right word there i don't know precursing. whatever coming before coming before yeah <laughs> that's what she never mind um uh... so but yeah, and if I'm, he's such a huge fan of The Clash, and see, I saw this show twice at Fringe, and it was just so well done, and you know it mixed things like um, like punk and British culture and Train Spotting and Quadrophenia, like it mixed all of those things together and had a Clash soundtrack. So, I mean, how can you go wrong with that? Now, I'm so glad that you encouraged me to join you for this. Because I, I discovered The Clash much later mm -hmm. than when they were popular. You know, growing up in the deep, deep south, for some reason, The Clash didn't reach <laughs> me <laughs> when they were sort of being the, you know, informative, controversial, influential force that I know that they were. Mm -hmm. So sitting in there in that theater, I got to discover The Clash songs in a different way. And that was the beauty for me. And then also sitting there with you, seeing how much you were enjoying it, and then discussing it afterwards with you of what you saw and things that you picked up on that I didn't pick up on. Um, that that was a great night at the Fringe Festival. I thoroughly enjoyed that show. Good. And I hope that comes back. I definitely want to see that again. Uh, and then last on my list, uh, rounding out my top five, I feel like Rob from High Fidelity. What? <laughs> From High Fidelity, yeah, the movie, I, Rob. I High Fidelity. Yeah. My all-time top five. Oh. <laughs> like, my 2017 <laughs> I'm top sorry. five I shows. Did, <laughs> didn't make, uh, it took me a moment. Sorry. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, number five is another thing you mentioned is the Zoe Escape Room from Escapade Games. For everything that you had mentioned, everything I said, the fact that I was screaming in literal terror in an escape room when I don't even do that in haunts for the most part says a lot. If you love horror, you love being scared, you love haunts, you love escape rooms, go. If you haven't gone yet, go just seriously, just go. Yeah. I, I have to agree with that. Oh, uh, uh, can I, can I show you, I'm going to like show you a piece of paper that I have a note written on. So this is, this is like my, on my top. That was part of my top list. That was the other thing that I left out, actually. Mm -hmm. Now that we've we, that now that you've brought up a couple of things, <laughs> the one that I didn't say was another top thing for me. So I guess this makes seven for me, is the Hollywood Fringe Festival as a whole, mm -hmm. because that was just um, it, it was such a great festival this year. I saw so many different things. We both did. I mean, you saw everything from magic to comedies to dramas to ranging in subjects from you know, uh, murder and serial killers to crazy rock bios, you know, to, you know, I, I hate the term jukebox music, jukebox musical, but that's sort of what London Calling would be categorized as. So like it was such a wide variety and it kind of exploded this year mm -hmm. and had such an energy about it that I'm really looking forward to see what 2018 holds for that festival. So I'm going to throw that in since you brought up a couple of things from, from Fringe Festival. Sure. That's a good top three you have, Russell. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, we never really said top three. Yes, you did. I'll sh I can right. show you the emails. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, right. so that was, that was our, our top things from 2017. We're in 2018, enough living in the past. We did some things. We already have done some things, yes. That's what I just said. Thanks for Sorry, repeating. I'm, Thanks I'm for confirming. Right, um, okay, yeah. All right. uh, so the first thing we did it was called Dirty Tricks with the new Bad Boys of Magic. And going back to Fringe Fest, uh, the new Bad Boys of Magic was a show or a, do you call them a show or do you call them the people? The, like, I'm not what? sure. So the new Bad Boys of Magic had a show at Fringe that we saw and you can hear that on the podcast episode i don't know whatever one has the review of fringe shows of that, the new bad boys <laughs> of magic um so they're back in doing a new show at the three clubs uh called dirty tricks and we went to their first night and it was awesome <laughs> i mean that's 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 the summary right there I, I, I how would you describe this show it was 
Like a variety show. Yeah. Yeah. Going into this, I, I assumed it was going to be, you know, another show like we saw at Fringe, um, but it wasn't. So uh, Daniel and Eric, who are the new bad boys of magic, they are MCs slash hosts. And there were three acts throughout the night and they came on and did some did some tricks before and then in between each of them. Um and then when you, if you showed up a little earlier, there was someone doing close-up magic to each of the tables, uh, which was fantastic. Um, but yeah, so it's not a straight-up magic show. But that's okay because everyone that participated was so good at what they did and so entertaining that it didn't even matter. Yeah, I'm uh, all right. I'm gonna drop the names since you since you. Yeah, well, that's what I, I was just giving a brief <laughs> overview, and then you could go into your in depth analysis. But, no, not in depth analysis, but just to to it is a variety show. That is, I think, the best way to describe what they're what they're aiming for. And at the show, we saw um, Siegfried Tiber. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, or, or Tiber, uh, who uh, you might have seen on Penn and Teller Fool Us, the television show. Who did uh, fool him? Uh, yes, who did? Uh, he came out and did some really clever. Uh, well, he he did card magic, but it was also some mentalism. It was a weird mixture. Very funny, highly entertaining. There was also a ventriloquist, which had one of the oddest acts, and I mean that as a compliment, <laughs> um, who sort of had an uncooperative uh, a person help or a, a partner helping her. Uh, and her name was Hannah Laskowski. Uh, and the close-up magician you mentioned was amazing. His name was Hub. And there was also a professor and mentalist Carl Christman, who I thought was fascinating because not only did he do what seemed to be mentalism, he also related it to human beings and their habits and their their the, how easily we can fool ourselves mm -hmm. and be fooled by others. So it was a wide variety, and the show lasted a little more than an hour. Uh, it uh, the the actual show. So what by by that I mean going on lights go down mm -hmm. they come out and the acts come out but the actual i guess experience if you want to call it that is probably two so i think doors opened an hour before showtime and if you do go to this i would recommend getting there early uh, because i think there was also someone reading tarot cards tarot cards um and and then also the the close-up magic and i don't know if that will be the same every every show or if they'll have more or or different people there but definitely get there early hang out it it's it was great and actually uh you can look up uh dirty tricks on eventbrite all you have to do is do a search for dirty tricks and the shows will come up and we'll also have a link in the show notes there's a date in february that's on sale there's a date in march on sale and they do list other acts that will be appearing other close-up magicians that will be appearing uh, including people that I know, Mike, you and I have seen John Armstrong perform because mm -hmm. he was at the Fringe Festival. He's listed as potentially coming to one of the future shows. Oh, great. So like, this is something to keep an eye on because it's a variety show. It's a good night out. It takes place in a very casual bar-like atmosphere. I agree with Mike. Get there early so you can get a good table. Uh, order a drink in advance if you if you want to. Uh, it's It's a really fun evening. And it's nice to have this type of thing. We have comedy clubs galore in this town, but this is a variety show that caters to, I think, a wider range of subject and talent than just a comedy club would. So, and the fact that it's hosted by, as you said, Daniel and Eric, the new bad boys of magic, I think it it potentially has the the, the potential of being a consistently running fun variety show that'd be worth visiting multiple times. Yeah. At least that's what I'm hoping it turns into. Yeah, definitely agree. And for more information on the new Bad Boys Magic, you can check out their website at badboysmagic.com, on Facebook, New Bad Boys of Magic, on Instagram, Bad Boys Magic. And then after that show, we went back to a very familiar place. We went to Zombie Joe's to go camping. Yes, we did. Great summary. <laughs> Uh, we went to see the new show, Camp Witsit, and this was definitely an experiment. It only ran uh, one weekend, yeah. partially because it was an experiment. Yeah, and it was it was interesting. Uh, it wasn't so much horror or anything that was, like, when you 
when I hear Zombie Joes, I think messed up. I think un PC. I think just effed up imagery, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. This was none of that. And I'm not saying that, that that's a bad thing. It's just different. And it's okay because it was still fun. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I'm just going to flat out say this. I really had fun at this. I really had a good time. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly what I expected. I, I agree with you in the, that. Um, the description in advance was sort of that we were potential scouts that, and we were going to earn some badges and there were going to be counselors helping us earn those badges. That was the basic plot that we were given before we go in. And look, if you want to talk story, if you want to talk um, logistics, you could really sort of pick a lot of bones with this thing because it doesn't make sense. Some of what they do inside doesn't make sense. I didn't care because I was it was fun laughing so much mm -hmm. or at one point one and it was very funny because I don't know if you heard this I um two people went through at a time so Mike you and I went together did you hear me scream ever yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> one of the counselors scared me and she kind of cracked up because she was surprised that I got scared <laughs> at what she had done. And so we had this moment and I was, uh, I w we were blindfolded most of the time. We mm -hmm. couldn't, and even when we were not blindfolded, it was very hard to see because it was very dark. So this was sort of, this is along the level and I, uh, this is going to sound weird and childish, but this was a along the level of pranks you would play on friends as a kid. Or those haunted houses where, like, feel the eyeballs. Yeah, exactly. Like that kind of stuff. And, and in the camp setting, it's, it's, some of it was camp pranks. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you hear that noise right next to you? That's, that's a snake. You know, that's a spider crawling on you. That's a, it's that kind of prank. I had a really fun time with this. I hope they bring this back or do something more with this because I thought it was really, really fun. And you know what, Mike, the, the weird thing for me is I had such a good time partially because it wasn't overly aggressive and overly hauntish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was a nice break. Yeah, exactly. Change of pace. It was, it was immersive without the dark, mm -hmm. except it was really dark and we couldn't see. Um, yeah. and that, <laughs> that's kind of one of the issues I had with it. And I, I don't know if it's necessarily an issue, but I wanted to see these counselors that were talking to me. Like, you know, I wanted to see a lot of it. And I understand that some of it wouldn't make sense if you could see, but I think we were blindfolded a little too much because I wanted to see everybody, you know, I like, agree with you. I, I do agree with you. Mm hmm. You know, and we did see a glimpse of the counselors at the end. And it was like, I could have been seeing that the whole time. Like, yeah, oh, that's a too. bummer. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, just, I agree with you. Uh, because I, they could have done, uh, there's, there's one test in particular to earn a badge mm -hmm. where you, that it required you to balance. Yeah. And Which wouldn't make sense if you weren't blindfolded. Exactly. That yeah. was the example I was going to point to. However... It's like there could have been ways where we could have seen the lead up or the aftermath of that, you know, that could have been, they could have had fun with that. Right. If they went to a more teasing approach rather yeah. than a, not, I'm not, not serious because it wasn't serious, but more of a, like, take the blindfold off, turn around, like, ha ha, we fooled you. Look at that. That's what it really was. Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. it, it just, cause there, like I said, it had a very prankish feel about it. Mm -hmm. And I wish they had highlighted that a little bit more. And I agree with you. I think we were blindfolded a little bit too long. And I totally understand for the format and the experiment of that, what this show was completely makes sense. And I have no regret going to it. I had a really good time. Good. But this was really fun. Yeah, I agree. And you had so much fun that you went back like the <laughs> next night. So um, Zombie Joe's has uh, been for years been doing something, which is, you know, speaking of experiment, it's a very experimental sort of theater thing, which they do yearly, and it's called the 50-Hour Drive-By Theater Festival. And the sort of the, the timeline of this show, and actually they, they print the timeline on the program that they give you going into the show. Uh, writers are 
given through a lottery three props that they have to incorporate into a short play. Um, they write the scripts, they rehearse, finesse, block, do everything in 50 hours, and then they hit the stage and they perform it for the public. So it is very experimental. It's like, I know people who've done, like, the, there used to be one in Los Angeles. I don't know if it's still going on, the 48-hour film festival, where you make a short film in 48 hours. This is sort of the same concept, except it's live theater pieces. And it ended up with four short plays, and they were called Somewhere Becoming Rain, Blood Moon, Nasty Little Pirates, and Welcome to Hell. Each one of them, I think, had strengths and, and weaknesses, because this is done so fast. This is an experiment. Again, I think, you know, I liken this to going to a comedy club or going to the variety show that we just talked about. I think not every act is going to appeal to every person in the audience, maybe, but there's always something there to enjoy. And that's how I felt about this. There was, you know, a couple that really didn't talk to me, but there was also one that I thought was really clever and really fun. Um, they turned one into sort of like a, a short story with a twist at the end. And then another twist at the very end. And I thought, wow, for something that was written and put up in 50 hours, like that's actually, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. And, you know, you, you recognized a lot of the regular players from Zombie Joe's Underground Theater. It was them obviously having fun, obviously experimenting with new material. This, I had a good time, you know, that's awesome. Very affordable ticket. Uh, they run, they do it early in the year, each year, this is something I would have no problem going back to and recommending to friends if if they're open to weird little experiments. And I mean weird in the best possible way. Rad. So for more information on Zombie Joes, where all of these things are taking place, find them on the web at zombiejoes.com. On Facebook, ZJU Theater, and that's T-E-R. On Instagram and Twitter, Zombie Joes. So after you did the 50-hour drive-by theater festival, you went to another show. Yes, I did. Uh, we talked about a show last year called Betwixt mm -hmm. um, from the Wolseley Institute. Yes. And we both enjoyed that show. And they have sort of reappeared, the Wolseley Institute has. And this becomes one of those things, Mike, where I don't know how much to say because... They 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 said that they were accepting applications for the spring, mm -hmm. and uh, with the, I guess the winter spring enrollment. And so, if you sent in an application, they asked you several very fun questions, and you had to do a little digging to find the answer to one of them. And I got a response back that saying, you know, hey, congratulations, Professor Eaton. <laughs> You know, um, and so they call their patrons professors and the outlook of this seems to be that we are going on expeditions to do research for the Institute, which is what Betwixt was, mm -hmm. it was sort of the same premise. So in case they run this show more, in case this gets crops up again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but for me, Mike, what happened is um, when I got the acceptance letter that's saying that, you know, I am being accepted and they're looking forward to helping me, helping them with some research. I was given uh, an invitation to a Slack channel, mm -hmm. which I, you know, to be totally honest, I, I feel a show that runs a Slack channel. There's so many out there. And being that I work full time, it's really hard to follow a Slack channel. Right. Uh, however, what seems to be happening with this is occasionally they will share some information on the Slack channel or there's conversation about people who have attended the show on the Slack channel and comparing experiences about that, their experience within the show. So for the show, for me, I didn't do a lot of the Slack channel stuff in advance. Um, so the show for me became almost a continuation of Betwixt. I met Leopold and Winifred and uh, Leopold was with well, a character who, who introduced us at Betwixt, who sort of introduced us to the concept of the Institute. And this was a really interesting show. And I will say that the strength for me was, it, again, I, I don't want to go into, too, too heavily into spoilers, but it begins with a conversation, sort of an interview process. And I want to compliment the show for one thing in particular and that is integrating 
my specific experiences into the show. Cool. The show took place, you, you walked into what it was apparently, you know, Leopold and Winifred's home. And they sat me down. They said, we have some questions for you. And they asked about my experience. They asked about my health. How was I doing? How strong was I? And, you know, was I feeling good today? And eventually it got revealed that they were not really happy where they were because they felt something had invaded their space. And here's the thing, Mike, that I thought they incorporated really, really well was when they started talking to me about my own experience, one of the things that came up was they asked me if I'd ever had a night terror or experienced night terrors. And I said, well, no, I haven't. However, and Mike, you know this about me, I have had one utterly terrifying experience with sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I, I you know, I, I divulged that. I said, like, this is what I have had, but I've never had, you know, I did not have night terrors as a child, anything like that. They immediately incorporated that into the plot of the show. And the way they did it was they started pointing out why that would prepare me best to be the person to assist them tonight. Nice. And so what they did is they explained, and that was like, oh, well, we can tell you now, since you've had that experience, this is what we're experiencing. And like I said, they felt something had invaded, invaded their space and they wanted me to go investigate to see if I had any luck figuring out what this entity being whatever was. And so I went to a different part of the house and I encountered a character that you and I met in Betwixt. Nice. And if you, if you do any research, I think that's not a huge spoiler that this uh, character comes back. And the character was, for me, the most meaningful sequence I had in Betwixt. Mm -hmm. It was very emotional it was quite surprising in many ways. And I walked into that second room, this character recognized me. And we had a conversation about what he was doing there and how his life had changed since the last time I saw him. And there were references to things that had happened between him and my experience of the show last time we encountered each other. And he brought me sort of up to date on what he'd been doing, the confusion he was feeling. He was not as necessarily healthy as he was the last time I saw him. And he was dealing with a whole bunch of things. And he talked to me about those. And I thought that was a really wonderful, weird little present it was the fact that like, oh, hey, Russell, I remember you. Oh, wait, I don't remember when we saw each other. I don't remember. And, and we actually discussed some of that stuff. So that was a really nice sort of re-encountering that character. And this was a very short show. I mean, I'm talking 15 minutes or less. Oh, wow. So it was very brief. It was very to the point. And at the end, he made a comment to me, Mike, about seeing me again. So my impression is that the Wolseley Institute will be calling me again to possibly investigate something further. That's what I was left with. And I believe that might be the approach that they're taking to future shows. Hmm. Because he very specifically said, I'm not sure, Russell, when you and I will see each other again. And I got the impression that he hoped things would be a little bit different for him. So I tried to, you know me, I tried to offer, you know, support and help. And, and God darn it, I tried to fix him, Mike. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> I knew you would enjoy that. <laughs> so um, now, Mike, I don't technically know if this is the name of the show, but a word came into play in the Slack conversation in something that somebody was given, I believe, on the first night of the run of the show. And the word was catamagnet. Cat <laughs> Damn it. The word was catagmatic, which in old medicine, pre-modern medicine, that meant uh, a treatment that was supposed to help broken bones by forming calluses. And that seemed for me to reference sort of the emotional state that I found this character in that I had met before when he seemed vulnerable to me before. Now he seemed harder to reach. And I think the sort of like the callous reference is almost an emotional callous. So I think that was an interesting play on words. 
Now, other people, uh, going back to the Slack channel, I know other people had different information given to them. Uh, there were there were pro several props in the room. Some people were given information about the props. Some people were, like, there was one prop that was mentioned to other people, a mask in particular, that I had no reference to in my show. But other people I know did get a reference to it. So... I found it really interesting that they sort of adapted the show to me to reflect a continuation of what I had talked to this character about the last time I saw him. Yeah, that's really cool. So this is going to be, I think this is going to be, for lack of a better word, a serial. You know, mm -hmm. I think this is going to be like a serialized show. And I, I find that kind of interesting. Um, and, I'm, and I am looking forward to what comes next. Uh, technically, I, I will say that I, I there wasn't a lot there as far as mood, set, lighting. There wasn't a great deal done there. And I hope they experiment more with that. And the reason I'm saying that about this show is because they did experiment in betwixt with that. Mm -hmm. So I hope they go back to some of that. And uh, I hope I meet Caliban again. Cool. Sounds fun. Yeah, it was really interesting. If you would like more information on the Wolseley Institute, uh, look up the WolseleyInstitute.org or go to Instagram and look up the Wolseley Institute, and that is spelled W-O-L-S-E-L-E-Y Institute. Uh, and you'll see some things that they've posted. And if you search that as a hashtag, you will find other things that other people have posted. That's what we've done for the first few weeks of 2018. Um, before we go, I want to give a couple shout outs. Uh, Russell, you have someone. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we got an email from Kimberly, uh, who lives in Atlanta. Um, and apparently, she does do some traveling to other cities. And she is looking for immersive stuff in her area. And it sounds like she's, uh, we've also had emails in the past from people in Florida. We've had e emails from people in Chicago <laughs> that, that because we have this sort of podcast where we talk about immersive stuff in LA, uh, you know, she reached out and she kind of said like, Hey, I really enjoyed the podcast. I like hearing you talk about all the immersive stuff and like, I'm looking for more of it in my area. And so this is sort of a question. If any listeners know anything in the Georgia area, please let us know and we will pass it on to Kimberly. Or go to Atlanta and ask for Kimberly. Yes. Because it's all, there's only one. Approach strangers on the street and just say, are you Kimberly? Mm -hmm. I suggested, because there is like an Atlanta haunt review. There's a couple of publications and I did send her references to that. But again, this is one of those situations where we have you know, a listener saying, hey, enjoying the podcast, which we do appreciate your kind words, Kimberly. We really do. And if anyone contacts us with more information about something in Georgia, we will let you know immediately. So good luck. And I'm glad you're traveling to other cities. I'm glad you're looking. Um, we always recommend No Persinium as a guide. If you're going to any major cities, they cover San Francisco, New York. Well, uh, they're the guide to everything immersive. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so that is definitely a, a viable option for you to look up and try to follow along and, and also possibly plan a vacation or something to a show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have one from Leone, uh, sent us an email from New Zealand. And it's like, whenever we get out of country, like emails <laughs> like this, it, it still always blows my mind. Even after like three or four years, however long we've been doing this, it feels like 40. Um, Gee, but, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, yeah, never mind. Uh, don't go there. It just feels like a lot. Um, but it's just, it's so cool to hear that people in New Zealand listen and care enough to send an email. Like, we're just two nerds talking about LA stuff we've done, you know? And, um, Leonie, I'm actually at my job, I'm working with Weta on some things and I'm just trying so hard to convince and fool my job to send me to New Zealand. So if that happens, I'm going to come looking for you. And I don't mean that in a, I'm going to kill you way. I just mean that in a fun, like, Hey, I know someone in New Zealand kind of way that, that came out creepy, didn't it? It, it totally came out. Right. creepy. <laughs> Never mind. It's what you do. Yep. So with, I'm just going <laughs> to shut up now. Um, if you want to reach out to us and get threatened on the podcast by me, you can reach out to me at Mike at my hauntlife.com or Russell at my hauntlife.com with two S's and two L's. Uh, find us on Thank the web. Thank you, Kimberly, by the way. Yeah. 
You can find us on the web at myhauntlife.com. You can find us on all the social medias, including YouTube at My Haunt Life. Um, and leave a message or a text on the haunt line, 515 Haunt LA. So it's 2018 again, and it's just the beginning. We have a long year ahead of us with many, many things to do. So we will see you at all the things. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. See ya. Get out. Mm. We're done for now. Scratch that. Um, Great. More work for the editor. Yep. (laughs) Damn you. Hold on. I'm going to drink now. Okay.